there. The best person to write is you. Dave. Thank you very much. I'm Azrael Johnson. This is Writing Nights Press. Take the night off, starring three amazing people you will meet tonight if you have not met them already. Jesse James, Helsius, Jacob King, and Sue Flat. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> I would like to open the night. Um, someone mentioned my headdress, and every time someone mentions my headdress, I have to read this poem. So, um, and it kind of, I'll, if you want a further explanation, I'll do it. Uh, all right. It begins with a quote from Saraha. If you remember Saraha, that's the name. When you wear kitten ears and a little boy, you aren't making a statement on gender or freedom. You are just letting people know that you are too strange, too tall to. Most writers and speakers will dress in dark browns and black, because the things they say are said with dignity and more important than physical distraction. I think wearing little boys and kitten ears is important to express gender freedom. <laughs> I also feel it is good to let people know I'm strange, but I'm never too tall. What can possibly what can possibly be more important than physical distraction, expression, performance? While many speakers choose dark brown and black, it is only because those colors are easy to keep maintained. They would never presume to tell another creator how to express themselves. Anyone who commits this kind of error is a true writer. <laughs> Is there something in the way? Yeah. Okay. I tried to make it four or five. So, if you will notice, we have pieces of white laminated paper all around that have different words on them, such as, finish the sentence, my superpower is, or uh, write a poem to someone you love, or whatever that says. What is your message? What, 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 yes. what is your message? Mm -hmm. I'm not as well done. Evil twin Dante, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are meant to be from. Obituaries 
once or twice or seven times. To read about all the miscarriages. Apparently, interspecies copulation is impossible. Hercules was a lie. Human beings were not meant to conceive demigods. That truth ruined my marriage long before the internet ruined my occupation. After all this time, I'm not even sure that I can die, but this Bruce Wayne character from a couple towns over, he's agreed to fill the fortress of solitude with kryptonite. He's even going to have his butler bolt the doors with more of the stuff. I'm not sure if I would die of starvation or dehydration or asphyxiation or if I'll finally just be weak enough for old age to do me in, but I swear I'm not leaving that place until I've shuffled off this mortal coil. Maybe then someone else could be the superhero. If you feel the need to have a funeral, please, no one sing that stupid song about how heroes have a right to bleed, how men weren't meant to ride with clouds. I actually loved that song the first time I heard it flying 212 stories in the sky, but they just kept requesting it. Radio ruined music, just like movies are ruining the conversation. I am is I feel like a lot of us write about ourselves all the time, right? Everything is first person all the time. Not, not always, but so much autobiographical stuff. And I wanted to see what would happen if I wrote nothing autobiographical. If everything was in somebody else's voice or something else, some other thing's voice. So some of the pieces in here are, uh, are inanimate objects as well. And one of the ones I like the best is uh, it's a bottle of Jack Daniels, right? It wasn't supposed to be this way. I mean, I know I'm not single malt scotch or anything, but still, I wanted to be somebody's bachelor party. Or I would have liked to have been in a rocks glass, drunk by a music maker carefully composing his 21st century symphony in between sips of me. Or I would have liked to have been kicked back by a wild woman, sure of herself, eager to drink down her day's end with confidence in her toast. Instead, I am here, bottle wrapped in a paper bag, grasped in a once great man's red hands. His skin is like dried clay. It testifies to a time past abundantly full of people and language and yes, war, but also balance and buffalo. All these possibilities extinguished by pale hands. Their wretched work done well with rifles and muskets, untrue treaties, smallpox blankets, and yes, even Christianity. So I understand, I do. Racism, poverty, and genocide, they really are justifiable reasons to drink alone. Except that's what Manifest Destiny always wants. What's a bond? in Lynchburg, Tennessee, really supposed to do anyway. Anybody want to drink? <laughs> um, what do we do after that? Uh, okay, another inanimate object. Anybody like Detroit? Anybody like Detroit? Yeah. 
Sure. Okay, yeah, all right, cool. All right, good, good, good. Detroit, uh, if you go to Detroit, Henry Ford Museum, right? Awesome, awesome, awesome place. Uh, they have some cool stuff there. This poem is in the voice of bus number 2857 in the Henry Ford Museum. I stay in Detroit now. It's a city most people would like to forget, so it seems like a good place to keep things most people have forgotten about already. The rough draft of the Declaration of Independence is a few display cases away. You can go there, and you can read under the lights behind the glass. You can see scribbled notes from Adams and Madison to Jefferson. The words, all men are created equal, and all is circled in red with a list of omissions dotted in the margin. When you finish revising your views on the founding fathers, you can round the corner, and you'll see me. You can climb on board. You can sit where Sister Park sat. And when you do, lights come on and an announcer reminds you what her story sounded like. Move back, Sarah. Lynn. No. Hi. The announcer will teach you that in 1955 in Alabama, bus drivers carried guns. You knew she was arrested that day. Did you realize she could have been shot and it would have been legal? Some say she was chosen intentionally because it is more difficult to kill an older woman. Already 42 that December day, she said her feet hurt. And I'm sure they did. When you get off, please have your picture here. And when you look back at that photo, Try to remember that this freedom thing, Chautauqua, if they couldn't get it right the first time on paper, what made you think real life was going to be in the book? The Puritans. Yeah. Let's play like a Puritan on this Um, okay, so uh, one of a good creative writing prompts too that I've often been given is to write in the voice of somebody who is completely unlike you, right? So for a guy, the obvious starting place is a woman. And if you're gonna pick a, <laughs> if you're gonna pick a woman, um, how about Mary, mother of Jesus? My son should have been a carpenter. He should have joined the union, paid his dues, married a nice Jewish girl, given me grandchildren, like his brother. But revolutionaries get remembered. And he had it all. The hair, the voice, the temper. Just like his father, God, when he was angry. <laughs> but I am no martyr, just a mother who knows carpenters die old with calloused hands. Revolutionaries are snubbed out before their time. The legacy comes later, after the stones have rolled away and the smoke has cleared. Truthfully, he should have left divinity to me. Women always did make better gods. Creation <laughs> comes more naturally for us. And that may not sound like something the woman you read about would say, but books written by gods and men rarely get the women right. We either ruin everything or save 
everyone. Stones and sanctity are hurled at us in equal measure. And no one ever bothers to ask us what we want. All I ever wanted was for my children to be good. <laughs> and then uh, as and I went back and forth uh, with, uh, with the cover and what we were going to put put on the back, he put some of my most tawdry lines on the back <laughs> at first, and I thought, ah, I don't know. Um, so we ended up going with um, some lines from Athena, a warrior philosopher princess. So... <laughs> So, you know, if you're going to write in the voice of Mary, you might as well go for a Pika Athena, too. Um, <clears throat> my story, my story sounded good at first, but my story was a lie. I did not spring full grown from the forehead of God. As far as any woman is concerned, no life has ever been shot from any part of a man. <laughs> Life crawls slowly and often painfully from woman. I was not ejaculating. I was pieced together like Dr. Frankenstein's monster from the deceased remnants of the very first stories told in this place. This is why I am patron saint of so many things, wisdom and just warfare, always at odds with the pieces of myself. The truth is, we gods and goddesses can fight and fuck and fall because we were made by men in your image. I do not envy you. Your Existence is tangible, but your origin forgotten. I suspect because along the way, you figured you could justify killing each other for some cause worth unknowing one another. Mm. You have forgotten yourselves because you have forgotten your mothers and forsaken your origin. If you ever do, Find your mother and creator. Please tell her her granddaughter would like a word the same as any child with delinquent parents wants to know when and why they messed up. <laughs> Do I got time for a few more? Yeah, yeah okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. okay, all right, cool. Um, in that case, let's do Vertigo. Um, Help me get the first book out. Getting there, Poets Haven Press. Um, one of the fun poems from here that's, I guess, a little bit empathetic, but not really. Uh, probably a little bit. Well, we'll see. This is called Eyeing, Eyeing Mormons at the Laundromat. <laughs> oh, you latter-day saints, you grown men with the faces of boys, chins and cheeks clean-shaven, stiff white shirts tucked in. I see you from behind bandanas, sleeveless shirts, and the funk of weightlifting. And I watch you neatly fold all your short sleeve dress shirts, all the same like they came from Charlie Brown's closet. And I wonder if you've ever been in love. As you silently scribble scripture notes in your tiny notebooks, I wonder if your thoughts turn towards me the way mine have turned towards you. Granted, I don't know anything about you, but your eyes, seem to know nothing of my world either. When you leave this room full of washing machines and tumble dryers, I wonder, where do you go? 
Surely you don't live like me. Drinking beer from oversized bottles, listening to DJs scratch out instrumentals, reading the Bible slowly and laughing at the kinky parts. <laughs> <laughs> Pouring coffee for picky people who say too many insincere thank yous, in love, falling fickly, impersonating Yoda just to pass the time, and dodging the regimented worship of the Christ by writing rhymes and talking intimately with women. No, this cannot be what your life is like. Men who attack the task of wearing and washing clothing the way you do, don't get dirty. I picture you drinking water or maybe grape juice while watching your little sisters in neatly pressed light blue dresses play violin. You seem to take the Old Testament too seriously. I bet you even wash your hands before picking up a holy book, and I'm sure you'd never dream of doing a terrible thing like dog-earing the pages or jotting notes in the margin. Maybe you would pour coffee, but you'd probably wear a necktie to do so, and you'd pass out courteous your welcomes with the Book of Mormon. If you go to the laundromat, do you go to the movies? And if you go to the movies, do you laugh at or scorn the heathenism of idol Yoda? I'm sure, I'm sure you would never dodge any regimented worship of the Christ. Or would you? By hiding behind unrealistically starched shirts and toting freshly sharpened Bibles. And then, if I can end on, uh, we moved to Lima, Ohio a few years ago so that I could actually get a full-time job. That was helpful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Lima is the canton on the west side of the state, and uh, we've lived there just long enough now that I've started writing some love songs to Lima. Um, and one of the first political activism things my wife and I did you remember a few years ago, there was, unfortunately, there was a shooting at a recruitment center, a military recruitment center, and then all across the country, we had these militia groups that were guard protecting the protectors, right? And so I wrote protection. I stood on the sidewalk questioning a man more willing to direct his automatic weapon at me than to make eye contact with me. He twitched and stuttered out his statements about pr protecting the protectors and adhering to the uniform code of military justice. But he spoke clearly, distinctly, and directly about his readiness to engage the enemy, Muslims and gangbangers, in a firefight. I taught my child to ride his bike just past the point where this hunter of indeterminate minorities stood guard. My wife and I, ever always activists, sought to make our community a better, safer place, took our concerns to the floor of city council. Enough of them did hear us that they set the wheels in motion, and soon the militia was disbanded. Because protection against the least holy and most intolerant sides of our conflicted nature, that's the only protection we've ever needed. How much are your books, Jacob? Oh, good. <laughs> I'm bad at selling things. Um, so I have books for sale. They are ten dollars. Um, they, yeah, they look like that. That's so reasonable. That's so reasonable. <laughs> right? Buy a book. Buy a book. Um, get us gas money to get back to life. <laughs> that ain't no joke. <laughs> Thank you guys very much.